Um, tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to welcome and well thank Anna Brian and welcome her to give her the first talk of the series here. And Anna is with the Arctic Marine Mammal Program here at Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and she studies ice seals in uh, beluga whale projects. She works on ice seal and beluga whale projects, and she's a biologist with the our Arctic Marine Mammal Program. And tonight she's going to be talking about wild, using wildlife detection dogs to help find ring seals in the wintertime, which is a pretty fascinating topic, as we will find out. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Anna to share her screen, and then we will open it up to questions at the end of the presentation. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Let me... Um... Hit the share button. And Jen, help me out. You said I need to also be sure that I yeah hit that optimize button. Okay. Yep. I think I'm sharing, and I'll go into the big screen here. Okay. Yep. Just go. Did it not go? Big screen and. Okay. Are we on big screen? Yep. So uh, as Mike said, my name is Anna Bryan. I work for the Arctic Marine Mammal Program. We're operated here out of Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, and I've been working here for about 15 years, I think, doing research on ice seals and on some cetaceans like beluga whales. I'm pretty excited about this talk. Um, as Mike said, it's a talk about using wildlife detection dogs to find ring seals and ring seal structures in winter. Um, real quick, I want to introduce my team. This is Justin Crawford, myself, and Lori Quakenbush. We're all biologists out of the Fairbanks office here for Fish and Game. On this project, Lori and I are dog handlers, and Justin is in charge of all the instrumentation and electronics. And I first want to orient orientate everybody. I know we're not all from Alaska. And to give a shout out to all the people from Minnesota that are up at like 10 o'clock at night. I appreciate you. I grew up in Minnesota, so I've got old family here that are listening. Um, so this is Alaska. We're here in Fairbanks giving this talk. And the study was conducted up in Prudhoe Bay, so up on the Beaufort Sea Coast. And our study specifically within the Prudhoe Bay area, so this is the Prudhoe Bay. This is Prudhoe Bay out in the water, and we have West Dock coming out here, which is a man-made causeway, out to STP, which is an oil and gas facility. And then we have another oil and gas facility here, North Star, which is offshore. And our study area is this blue, um, it's not quite a rectangle, but this blue area you can see. And real close to the edge here, there's this yellow line that runs from West Dock out to North Star. And that's actually an ice road that the oil and gas companies use during the winter time to get out to the North Star Island. And then we put a weather station out on the sea ice so we could monitor weather. And our weather station or our MET station is this dot in green. So I want to remind everybody we're going to get in the mood for the study. And the study is out on the sea ice. So this is a picture of the sea ice. Um, this project occurred during winter time out on the ice. Um, it's actually kind of a springtime for what others would think. We did it in April and May, but out there it's still winter. And this is sea ice that's connected to the land. So it's land fast sea ice and it has snow on top of it. So we're looking to get into this winter mode here. The overall objective for our study was to document how ring seals use the Prudhoe Bay area, which is a near shore oil and gas production area. And I wanna start, I talked about ring seals, which are a type of ice seal. And just so we're all on the same page, I wanna talk a little bit about them. First off, what do I mean by an ice seal? Well, ice seals are associated with sea ice during some part of the year. They're also known as ice associated, ice dependent seals, ice loving seals, or phagophilic seals. In Alaska, there are four types of ice seals. We have ring seals, spotted seals, bearded seals, and ribbon seals. And um, I'm specifically talking in this talk about ring seals. So ring seals are the most ice adapted 
of the species. They're the smallest. They're an important subsistence resource to coastal Alaskan natives. They're found circumpolar, so globally around the pole. Here again, we have Alaska, um, Greenland's up top here on this picture, Russia. It gives you an idea of where their distribution is. Within Alaskan waters, they're found in the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas. There's estimated to be at least 470,000 of them in Alaskan waters, and they are threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So talking a little bit more about ice ring seal dependence on ice during wintertime, they create these ice seal structures. So they actually maintain breathing holes through the sea ice so that they can breathe. They haul out on ice and in snow layers or a snow cave. They give birth in these layers and their pups are actually born with a white lanugo coat. So this is a picture of a layer, but I kind of want to walk you through it here. So first off, we have the seal, which is down there in the seawater. And we have our sea ice layer. So the sea ice forms during water. It's seasonally there during the wintertime. And then throughout the winter, we get snow that builds up on that sea ice. And sea ice isn't all flat. Sometimes we get deformation in it. So when the ice is forming, it can be rougher waters or there could be cracks where the ice separates um, and you get this deformation. And then if you get wind patterns, so in this case, let's say we have constant winds coming from the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen, you get a buildup of this snow behind that deformation and that's where oops, I went the wrong way. That's where these seals build their layers or their snow caves. It's real similar if anybody does um, winter camping and has ever camped out in a snow cave made your own. It's a similar idea. The seals can haul out in this, and they can. It keeps the heat in, so they stay warm. Um, the seals come up through the sea ice through an access hole. So they've dug out this access hole, similar to how they do breathing holes. And the layers end up with kind of a crusty ceiling. So the as the seals are exhaling and breathing, that top layer of the, the yeah, the top layer of the layer, the ceiling of the layer becomes hard. And so it kind of creates this protective shell on the top of it that I'll talk about a little bit more later. But those are the different parts of the layer. Um, this is an example of a breathing hole. Here we have the snow. This particular breathing hole is open to the surface. And then here's the hole that the seal is maintaining through the sea ice. They can maintain these holes through two meters of ice. This is another example of the sea ice. So this is an example of sea ice that's fairly flat. Um, and this is in contrast to sea ice that's more jumbled. Uh, this more jumbled ice is where you're more likely to find drifting of snow and maybe more of those layers than the breathing holes, or in addition to breathing holes, sorry. So one of the big challenges for trying to study ring seals in the winter time is that these structures are under that snow um, in the solid ice. So if you look at the picture on the top right here, this is a breathing hole and we know it's a hole because we found it previously. That's where the stake is. And then it's been covered over with snow as the winds have come back and forth, but you can't see it at all from the surface. And same thing with the layers. These layers are in drifts of snow. And this bottom photo on the right is a picture of a layer that's where the snow is piled up behind this deformation. And that snow is built up and the seals built a layer in there. So because neither of these structures are visible from the surface, they're hard to study in winter. And this is where our wildlife detection dogs come into play. So we use these dogs to sniff and to smell the seals uh, structures out on the ice. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the dogs here real quick. We have two dogs, Stout and Indigo. They're actually a brother sister team. They're five and a half year old purebred black Labradors. For a general introduction, Stout's a big runner. He loves to ski -jer. Uh, He's had a long history of interest in marine mammals. That's Whaley, that's his favorite toy. And Indigo is our other dog. She is a um, ball dog, if you've ever heard of one of those. Um, she is 
obsessed with them. She will carry two or three in her mouth at any one time. I've seen her find balls in snowdrifts that are three or four feet deep. Um, and she's the type of dog that would just go after balls all day long if you didn't stop her. Getting a little more specifically into the training of the dogs and how we went about doing this. We actually started with training at a pretty young age. Um, the dogs needed to learn basic commands first. So sit, stay, heal. We also taught um, whistle commands and hand signals. And then after they had basic commands, we got into more complex situations like snow machines. The snow machine training is one of the big parts of this whole study. We really need the dogs to run in front of the snow machine. And so training the dogs to run in front and have the confidence to be in front of us rather than running behind was really important. We also need the dogs to be comfortable riding inside of a kennel on the back of the snow machine because this can be kind of challenging and not all dogs like it. Um, training dogs to actually find seals is something, well, using dogs to find seals out on the sea ice is something that was traditionally done by the Canadian Inu In Inuit. And they would take a sled dog and let the sled dog go find the seal hole. And then they would hunt out of that hole. The humans would hunt for seals at that hole. And when scientific researchers saw that, they thought, oh, this is a great way for us to get find seal structures. So the researchers actually went to the Canadian Inuit and asked them to teach them how to do this. And so researchers started using dogs to find seal layers in about the 1970s. Within Alaska, that was first done with Brendan Kelly, John Burns, and Kathy Frost. Um, so these dogs then, once we, going back to our training, we actually taught the dogs how to find the seal scent using tissues from subsistence harvested seals. We used flippers and we trained the dogs to first identify that scent. We used the word nachik, which is the Nupiat word for ring seal. And then we took the dogs out to a field of snow. And because we didn't want to plant the flippers, we actually tossed the flippers out into a snowbank and then worked the winds such that the dogs found the flippers. And the dogs successfully found them all the first time we tried it. So that was great. For a little bit more in depth for how this works. So we have the dog which we want in front of the snow machine. And then in this example, the wind is coming from the lower corner, the lower um, lower left side of the screen, and it's going up to the upper right side of the screen. And the dogs quarter into the wind. So this first wind doesn't have any um, scent to it. And then as the dog moves forward now, this next wind has the seal breathing hole. So the dog smells the seal breathing hole and then the dog turns and heads to it. So to give you a real example here, I'll show you a video where the dogs get started. So the dogs are waiting for us to give them the go ahead. We give them the notchic sign and they take off. So we're running the snow machines and the dogs are now smelling the wind. The wind is coming from the right in this particular um, video. So the dogs are smelling um, things to their right. And as the dogs run along, we, um, we keep an eye on them. And once they smell a seal, they'll make that turn like you saw in the pictures. The dogs, we run them. Sometimes we run both dogs together. Other times we only run one dog. Um, when we're running like this, we tend to run up to about 11 miles a day. And the dogs run somewhere between eight miles an hour to 15 miles an hour as they're just generally going across the sea ice like this. When we're only running one dog, we put the other one in the kennel in a different sled and it follows behind. So oopsie, right there, the dog alerts. So now the dogs head off after the seal scent. This is an airborne scent. So the dogs are breathing it up in the air, not on the ground. And these dogs have a tendency to run faster. As you can see, once they 
catch a scent, they'll run up to about 25 miles an hour um, as they're going in towards a scent. Once they reach the structure, they stop. And then we get off and inspect the structure. So when we're finding structures that are on the surface, like breathing holes that are open to the surface, it's pretty easy. Once we get there, we know what we're looking at. This can be a little trickier for structures that are below the surface. So this next video is a video of a dog searching for a structure below the surface. And you'll see the winds weren't as strong on this day. So the dog zigzagged back and forth a little bit. But once she finds the structure, she starts digging in the general location of it. The smell is coming out from multiple places in the snow there. So she's not exactly certain 100% uh, where the um, breathing hole or where the access hole is. And so we'll come with a snow depth probe. And here you'll see Lori, she's gonna test multiple spots. Um, and we could feel if it was a layer, we can feel that ceiling that I talked about back on the earlier, or if it's a breathing hole, the hole will go down in the water like it just did. And Lori quickly found the breathing hole. Um, we don't always find the breathing holes quite as quickly as we did in that example. Sometimes the structures are quite buried in snow, so it can take quite a while um, for all of us to dig around and figure out where these are. Once we do find them, we uh, move the snow out of the way so that we can take a better look at the structure. So here I'm going to show you some examples first off of breathing holes. On the left, I have an example of a breathing hole that has had a bit of snow drift over the top of it. In the middle is a breathing hole that's completely open to the surface. And then on the right is a breathing hole that's almost closed off. So the ice, there's a dome that can form over the top of it. So this ice dome has started to form on this breathing hole and it's closing it off. Um, here's an example of a breathing hole, and these are still active breathing holes. The seals still use them, but this breathing hole has an ice dome over the top of it, and it was just big enough. We were just able to get a probe in there to figure out where it was, but otherwise this structure is completely closed off waterwise to the surface. This is another example of a breathing hole. Um, I really like this example. This is a breathing hole. You can see the breathing hole here, and it's in a pretty deep snowbank. So we had to dig down quite a ways to find this breathing hole. But if you take a step back and you look beyond the shovel here, this is actually, you can see it extending here. This is a crack in the sea ice. So this is a place where at one point as the sea ice was forming, it separated and it formed this crack and it reformed sea ice in the middle of it, and then snow drifted over the top. So this is, um, an example of an area that would likely have high density holes because seals have a tendency to use these types of areas. Now I'm going to show you, Stout wanted to know what the underside of a breathing hole looks like. Um, so we took a video and we looked here. So here's a GoPro going down into the breathing hole and we're able to look around down towards the base of the breathing hole. Um, you can see some of the marks on the side of the hole that the seals have left as the seals have kept this open all winter. And then under the ice, there's a brown sea ice algae that forms on the ice. So you can see that. There's some of that algae. And then as the camera's coming up here, you can see the claw marks on the side of the breathing hole where the seals have clawed at the holes to keep it open. And then we come back up to the surface. Here's another example of claw marks on a breathing hole where the seal is left. Now I'd like to talk about layers. So again, here's that example of the instrumented layer on the side of the deformation. 
Then we're gonna, again, here's the inside of the layer. We talked about it before. Here's our access hole. There's the ceiling. So that's that hard ceiling. And then there's a haul out dish. So when the seals come out of the water and they haul, their body heat melts the snow a bit or the ice a bit, excuse me. And so it forms this haul out dish where they rest. This is an example of a pupping layer. The seals pup in these layers and the drawing on the left, you can see the pupping layers have a more intricate chamber. So they build these side chambers, the pups do, as they're um, living in the layers. And I'm gonna show you a video here of a pupping uh, layer. Here's our access hole. And then it comes around and you can see these side chambers back in here on the side here. And some scratching up on the surface. And the seals have been scratching. And then we're back to our access hole again. This is another view of that um, with the haul out dish. This is kind of a wet haul out dish. It's got um, some seawater in it. And then looking back into the layer. This is an example of a layer that a polar bear broke open. So here you can see Lori is standing on the edge of the um, ceiling. You can see the access hole here with the claw marks. And the polar bear has crushed this kind of over the top of the breathing hole. So once we find a hole in a structure, then we start sampling, we take um, snow depth, we take water temperature, we take the size of the hole or the structure, and we look at water depth for where the structures are. And we also documented seal behavior. So we added cameras, um, temperature probes. We took temperature probes right over that haul out dish so that we're able to capture changes in temperature if seals fall out. And then we put light sensors in there. So here we're looking, the camera's actually over the top of the access hole, looking into the layer, I'm sorry, the camera taking the picture, excuse me, not the camera in the lens. And in 2023, we also put some cameras up at breathing holes so that we could document seal activity at breathing holes also. So here's our study area again. And now we have a map of what was identified in 2022. All the blue dots are breathing holes. The yellow dots are haul out layers and the red dots are pupping layers. And in 2023, here we can see our, again, the same, same thing, our breathing holes, blue, yellow, our haul out layers, and the red are pupping layers. We had a slightly higher density in 2023, so we found more structures in 2023 than we did in 2022. Um, to compare, in 2022, we found 47 breathing holes, 13 haul out layers, and one pupping layer. And in 2023, we found 60 breathing holes, nine haul out layers, and one pupping layer. And you can see that scratching really well in the pupping layer on this photo. The water depth for both years, um, we found seal structures between two and 15 meters of depth. So both of these are the same, um, study area we've been looking at, but the light green is shallower and then it gets deeper as we move offshore. So the deeper depths are out towards North Star Island. We were able to document seals using um, active areas near infrastructure. So we found um, active seal structures in ice roads, close to facilities. Um, we saw there's a hovercraft that they use um, late in the spring to get out to North Star Island. And we watched as that went by and two basking seals stayed on the surface. They didn't go in the water. We also interestingly found a breathing hole located the same 19 meters southeast of North Star in both 2022 and 2023. So that was pretty cool. Now getting back to our um, instruments, because we instrumented those layers, remember those temperature probes that are coming down, we put them through the snow. So there's one into the layer here and it's right above that haul out dish. So if a seal goes into this layer, that seal will 
put up body heat and we should see that temperature probe increase. So this is what the data from that look like. On the x-axis, we have the, the day and then on the, excuse me, yeah. And then on the other axis, we have the temperature here. So we have the yellow line is our outside temperature. So this is the temperature tracking the outside temperature. And then the blue line represents the temperature inside the layers. And for this particular layer, we did not have any seals haul out. And we can tell that because this temperature is pretty consistent and doesn't change over time. That's in contrast to this other layer. So with this layer, our blue temperature spikes up. So this is when a seal is hauled out. That seal warms up the temperature in the layer. And then it stays warm for about 12 hours here and it comes down. In this particular layer, you can see four different bouts of haul out bouts. Um, in 2022, we detected 11 bouts of hauling out at four different layers. Um, nine of them lasted 12 hours and two of them lasted six hours. And the cool thing is we were also able to um, document this with the cameras. So we're able to verify these with the cameras that we placed in the layers. Um, in 2023, none of the temperature probes um, showed haul outs, but um, our cameras did. So this is an example of a seal coming out of the cameras um, at night. So we know that the seals use the layers both during the day and at night. And then we were able to document the same seal, I'm sorry, different seals in one layer um, using the same camera. So here we have two different seals in the same layer, which is pretty neat to have documented. And the most interesting thing we found from our cameras is that seals spent time in the access hole without registering on the temperature probes. And this is really important. We didn't, uh, we weren't expecting to find that. This is the first time cameras have been put in layers that we're aware of. And we found that seals spent more time resting and sleeping in those holes than we expected. Um, in 2022, we found 78 bouts that were longer than 30 minutes and they averaged 1.7 hours and ranged from a half hour to um, 10 and a half hours. And the 2023 data, we're still analyzing it. So we haven't, we don't have those numbers calculated yet. Um, so our cameras that we put on breathing holes in 2023. And the reason we wanted to do this was because we documented those seals sitting in the um, breathing holes and we wanted to see if we found similar, I'm sorry, we saw the seals sitting in the access holes in the layers and we wanted to see if we found similar behavior here at the breathing holes. And we haven't summarized the data, but I have some general pictures. We put cameras out at nine breathing holes and we were able to find seals resting. We were able to document them sleeping in front of the layers. We also documented them um, opening up layers coming out after, sorry, breathing holes, not layers, apologies. Um, document them at breathing holes. This is a breathing hole that had had a snow drift go over the top of it. And so the seal is just peeking out after a snowstorm. This is a seal that's opening up a breathing hole after a snowstorm again. So the seal is moving the snow out of the way. Here we have an example of two seals using a breathing hole. So one's hauled out and one's resting in the breathing hole. And then we were able to document other species other than the seals. So this is a Arctic fox. We documented red foxes. We were able to find seagulls. And then our favorite was the ptarmigan. And this ptarmigan was at a seal hole that was more than a mile offshore. So that's an interesting find. So in summary, we were able to use our um, methods to find and to document seal use in this area. We were able to document interesting behaviors with our cameras and temperature probes. And in 2022, we found 61 structures for a density of 0.69 kilometers squared. 
And in 2023, we found 73 steel structures with a density of 0.83 kilometers squared. And I'd like to acknowledge a bunch of people. This project wasn't possible without a number of people. So our funders, we were funded by BOEM and BLM. Um, Hillcore Alaska helped us a lot. Amy Popoza, Jen Duchesne, and the crew at SDP were awesome. Um, Clean Seas helped us out. Alaska Clean Seas helped us out for snow machine use, as well as uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game Sport Fish Division and Wildlife Division. We got additional snow machines and trailers, trucks. Um, so that was great. And all marine mammals are federally permitted, so our research permits are there. And last but not least, we need to thank Indigo and Stout, our brother-sister dog team, without which there wouldn't be much to present. <laughs>